Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. Tonight, I want to speak to you about David Petraeus's resignation as director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and I suppose I would entitle this story something fishy, although there will be a great deal more for you than just that. <clears throat> so, the question is, why did Petraeus resign? And there's a number of underlying questions. Uh, the first one would be to roll back the clock to when the United Nations Resolution 1973 was passed to prevent the um, uprising in Libya from being put down by the Libyan government under Gaddafi at Benghazi. And the presumption was that there would be a cordoning off of Benghazi and potentially Misrata uh, leading to peace talks conducted by the African Union. So the key question is, what did the CIA tell the president? Uh, and so we have basically a number of different forces here. The CIA, the State Department, uh, which nowadays is almost joined to the hip to the CIA from what I understand, the Department of Defense, and then there's a the question of why Robert Gates resigned last year. Some say Gates resigned because uh, we essentially betrayed a ally in the war on terror as Gaddafi had voluntarily disarmed in 2003 and began providing assistance to the United States in the war on terror. And as has been the case in other socialist countries, there was actually a great deal of animosity between uh, right-wing religious extremists, uh, which we call Islamists, but uh, I prefer to just call them, uh, I suppose, right-wing Muslim extremists, um, and uh, socialist governments. Afghanistan, under the communists, uh, fought against uh, Islamic Muslim right-wing religious extremists, uh, Iraq also, which made the whole concept of Saddam Hussein collaborating with Al-Qaeda almost inconceivable. In Syria, there are right-wing religious extremists that are the primary muscle uh, fighting against the government of Assad, and in fact many Libyans, the same group that attacked Libya is attacking Syria, Qatar, and the Libyan Islamic fighting group and their affiliates. <clears throat> And some say Robert Gates resigned in disgust over this, which would mean, you know, who is the DOD, the Department of Defense? What do they have a uh, underlying uh, philosophy that endures beyond one administration to the other? And then we have the resignation of David Petraeus. So the question is, what did these forces advise President Obama? The understanding is that Obama was somewhat reluctant uh, to uh, attack Libya and that in fact um, uh, Hillary Clinton was the one pressing it along with Susan Rice and one other woman whose name I don't recall at the moment. So what did the CIA advise the president? Now the key issue with Libya is that people living inside the bubble, meaning loosely educated such as Hillary Clinton, um, would presume that they were helping a democracy, for example, uh, form in Libya, not really understanding the complexity and nuances of the situation. Um, and presumably, uh, experienced people in the CIA and the Defense Department would know that the situation is vastly more complex than that and that we would have uh, a, uh, a uh, reactionary right-wing forces at work in Libya along with uh, democratic forces. Um, so was Bob Gates' resignation related to this betrayal of an ally in the war on terror? Because to take this UN peacekeeping resolution and use it to drive the government out of office after that government had voluntarily disarmed uh, seems uh, a betrayal, uh, regardless of one's feelings about Gaddafi. And then the question we have is why did Petraeus resign? Because it looks quite suspicious. Uh, that he would resign right after the Libya affair, the Benghazi affair, um, and right after the election. Um, so uh, I will try to find you a few titles of articles. Let's see if I can find this for you. 
so here we have Petraeus throws Obama under the bus October 26th by William Crystal so you can read this yourself later on <clears throat> Now, let's see here. Um, so we have to ask, did the CIA warn against this betrayal uh, and to take a peacekeeping resolution and use it to drive war? Um, where is the report? Can we see the uh, decision-making and debate that went on uh, to make this decision to uh, bomb Libya? What were the arguments? Was Obama reluctant and Clinton hawkish? Was Petraeus forced out for not covering Obama's back and nearly costing him the election? If it hadn't been for Hurricane Sandy, it's quite possible Mitt Romney would be the president and not Barack Obama. <clears throat> it certainly would have been quite a bit narrower because this Libya story has a life of its own and won't go away. But the frustrating thing for those of us who have covered Libya outside of the bubble um, is that there's a lot of problems with the whole uh, uh, militarization of a, uh, of a uh, uh, demand for greater freedom in these countries. A uh, study has been done of countries that had peaceful versus violent revolutions, and peaceful revolutions have a vastly higher chance of, uh, of having positive outcomes, and there was no effort made to have a a peaceful uh, 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 outcome. And if you go back and look at other pieces I've done, I go into this in excruciating detail, and I won't cover it tonight. Then one has to ask, are our elections in of themselves fair and free? Why won't Carter Center, for example, cover American re elections since they certify all the others? And why did Carter certify the elections in Libya when Libya prohibited anyone associated with its political life in the last 40 years from running or even talking? <clears throat> Was a deal made to give Obama the presidency by the forces that control the voting apparatus? Now these questions don't mean that the answer is yes. The answer could very well be no. I am not a conspiracy theorist. But the United States right now is in a very uh, uh, difficult situation for freedom of individuals. We've lost most of our constitutional rights through the National Defense Authorization Act, SB 1867, uh, the Patriot Act. Uh, Obama has had greater secrecy than any, uh, uh, any administration in history. Uh, he's had uh, greater harshness and reprisals against whistleblowers. Bush was it was you know equally bad except that there's a trend line where it's accelerated under Obama it's gotten worse under Obama but Bush and Obama have a continuation of this national security state so what used to seem like paranoia now is actually contemplatable um, and why did Victoria Nyland uh, who is the State Department spokesman and Jay Carney claim that we you, we don't just have a crew waiting around to uh, go into Benghazi. It takes uh, a while to form this. Now, think about police departments and SWAT teams. I mean, and this is 9-11. The whole world was on alert, and I want to show you something. So this is uh, the military bases of the United States, such as I was able to obtain. Um, uh, and here are the distances. So from Izmir, to Benghazi is 595 miles and from the one that I would have thought we would have come from oh, there we go uh, Sigonella in uh, Sicily it's 470 miles and you damn well better believe we would have forces in these places that could have been dropped so um, you know with the that means we should have been able to get there in two hours two hours and um, the what was the time uh, lapse from the first reports to when uh, the ambassador uh, was uh, unconscious in the safe room, uh, uh, dying of smoke inhalation? 
Uh, we can assume that we're looking at, uh, uh, I think he must have uh, died around 10 uh, p.m. U.S. time, so there should have been uh, something like six hours uh, to be able to intervene with a one-hour flight involved. Um, now, Gore Vidal also asks, in the case of the original 9-11, why didn't Jet scramble them? And uh, I don't want to even claim that I've uh, researched this matter, but it's certainly an interesting question since that was, apparently was our standard policy for hijacked airplanes. Of course, the uh, inductive method would indicate, uh, an answer of caution would be that uh, they were concerned that uh, the plane was, would immediately be um, uh, 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 crashed by the uh, hijackers, but nonetheless it is, uh, as long as we're on the subject of 9-11 and why people don't take off quickly and stop things, one has to ask, were they ordered to stand down then? and were they ordered to stand down now. And the Defense Department and the CIA are not, uh, are giving signals that there was reluctance. And why would there be reluctance? Well, uh, because the United States wants to retain its influence, and the West want to retain their influence on Libya, and they believe that going in and doing an intervention in Benghazi would have enormous uh, political ramifications that would weaken U.S. influence in Libya and that frankly it would be worth for U.S. lives with all respect to these families uh, uh, I'm not advocating this at all uh, because you know many lives were lost in this conflict and um, in Afghanistan every day people are dying countries flooded with injured veterans uh, suffering from PTSD which we'll be having to pay for for decades in vast, vast sums. So uh, compared to other crises and problems, they probably would have thought that uh, taking that risk and assuming that they, you know, they were throwing the dice that the local guards could keep the situation from getting out of hand, um, that the safe room would be able to protect the ambassador until help arrived. But nonetheless, I was very annoyed at this, uh, the, you know, this constant obfuscation of facts where uh, Victoria Nyland, Jay Carney uh, dismissed the idea of being able to get there rapidly. That's absurd. We have the largest military and secret police and intelligence agency system in the world. It's 40% of the entire world system and uh, we're claiming we can't get there. I mean, that's absolutely absurd. I mean, these are all uh, U.S. Uh, centers that I'm zooming out on right now. Any police department could have responded more quickly. Um, now, let's see here. There is a Ms. Ben Suda, who is the International Criminal Court Prosecutor, who's looking into one of the three uh, uh, mass collective punishment war crimes in Libya that are very black and white. The first was Sirt, the hometown of Gaddafi, one of the largest cities in Libya, an extremely uh, well-built city with uh, a massive conference center that was to host the African Union, a uh, lot of expensive and modern infrastructure that was utterly annihilated by NATO, uh, along with uh, the Qatari uh, uh, and special forces from NATO on the ground, the drones, the bombers, and uh, the jihadists, as well as the legitimate freedom fighters, as one might call them, or counter-revolutionaries or revolutionaries. This city was raised to the ground. It's totally unrecognizable. Now, the second city to be uh, faced from the earth uh, by the um, Libyan uprising uh, was Tawerga, which is a black township from which missiles were fired into Misrata. And as long as we have Google Maps here, uh, I will zoom in and show you that as well. Um, and that's the town that uh, the ICC, International Criminal Court Prosecutor, is willing to consider prosecutions on. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, the least politically controversial, certainly. Um, then, 
Uh, the third city that was collectively punished, uh, Bani Walid, Beni Walid, uh, there's allegations of poison gas. So why doesn't she mention Sir? Why doesn't she mention Beni Walid? And there's probably quite a few crimes uh, to look into uh, down in um, the south of Libya, in um, around Saba, which we'll get to in a moment. So, let's see if I can get this for you. So, now in the case of Beni Walid, the West failed to report that it appears that people were shot at the protests in Tripoli. Um, the guards claim that two of their guys got shot, one in the neck and leg, and I have seen reports that people were shot during these demonstrations. It was never reported by the rest of Western press, and there was sufficient detail in the Western press that it does look like suppression of information. In other words, this is an important factor. If you cover a demonstration and you don't cover the fact that people were killed at the demonstration, it's not very good journalism. Okay, um, let's see here. Now, uh, since Obama's election, uh, today in particular, Israel, after their Sabbath, um, has simultaneously launched missiles into Syria and has threatened a ground invasion into Gaza. So we're going to have to try to follow this story and understand what's going on. Uh, irony of ironies in the news uh, was when Buddhist extremists in Burma persecuted Muslim minority, uh, which is a, a very bizarre juxtaposition. And uh, let's see here. Of course, there was a Russian arms deal in Iraq that was canceled um, because of uh, pressure from the West. The uh, U.S. arms sales have just gone through the roof, and U.S. percentage of arms sales last year was 75% of all arms internationally, and you can look this up. Uh, let's see here. The other interesting thing that happened recently was, and uh, one should really keep an eye on Turkey right now. Turkey is going through a very sinister phase. In Turkey, uh, during the uh, annual celebration of their independence, people who went to attempt to celebrate their independence or the formation of the modern state of Turkey after the fall of the Ottoman Empire under Kemal Ataturk uh, were harassed by the uh, uh, religious extremist government of Prime Minister Erdogan uh, and uh, and were uh, looked at badly for having uh, the founders of the countries uh, a picture in their cars. This was reported to me by a Turkish uh, co-worker of mine who's quite reliable and is a, in fact a physicist although she doesn't work in that capacity for us. Um, then there's the issue of what is the present government of Libya doing? Their only sole responsibility, their transitional government even now, is to set up a constitution, have it ratified. And this process is going painfully slowly. So if we look at Libya here, uh, Libya is composed of Tripolitania, Tripolitania Cyrenaica, and Benghazi is in Cyrenaica, and Fezzan. These were three ancient states of the Ottoman Empire. And interestingly, of course, it was the uh, Sheikh of Tripoli who created the first armed conflict with the United States by demanding tribute from American uh, merchants uh, traveling abroad. And Thomas Jefferson um, had to uh, reverse his course of downsizing the Navy uh, to pay off the national debt. Uh, in particular, and to prevent a military-industrial complex from forming. Uh, so at any rate, uh, there was originally a formula that there would be a hundred, uh, a, a block of a hundred uh, seats allocated to Politania, 60 to Cyrenaica, and uh, 40 to Fezzan, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, now they're looking at a 20-20-20 deal. Um, because they're not going to have a bicameral legislature, they're most likely going to have a unicameral legislature, from what I understand. Then, of course, there's the issue of Mali. 
Uh, now, the United States is trying to set up a military intervention in Mali. We're basically doing a mop-up operation after Libya. Arms have spilled over the borders in every possible direction due to our ham-fisted military intervention. The country um, that uh, uh, arms were released to the world at large. Um, Libya had a very small military budget compared to its size. Um, but their arms accumulation in previous periods in the 80s and 90s um, were significant uh, compared to um, Morocco or Tunisia, but certainly not compared to Algeria or Egypt. But these arms are spilled all over the place and they're right-wing religious extremists that are very powerful in Libya, fueled by the right-wing religious extremists that we sell arms to in Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And so in Mali, we've had terrible problems with desecration of historical sites in Timbuktu, which was the center of the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Empire of Songhai, a great, great empire in the late Middle Ages. Uh, and Timbuktu is full of rare manuscripts. And many of these were burned deliberately by uh, the uh, uh, group uh, in Mali that is seeking to install a a very strict Salafist uh, government there that is uh, a very strict Islamic government um, and uh, this can also trigger a refugee crisis it could kill a million people because the Sahel region of Africa is uh, already got bad refugee problems and bad climate change problems and bad food and security problems and bad terror problems um, so the U.S. was looking to put together a military force to go in there. Um, but in fact, uh, most of the local countries want to develop a non-military solution. There's an interesting, uh, let's see here, uh, I think that pretty much covers it. The United Nations uh, ambassador for the new Libya, Abdul Rahman Shalgam, has written a book called The End of Gaddafi. Uh, and there's quite an interesting story here about Qatar, um, but unfortunately I haven't been able to fully uh, translate it uh, in a sensible fashion. And I think that pretty much concludes it for tonight. Uh, my name again is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.